We've been talking about dealing with disappointments now. This is the third uh, week, and this is going to be the final week because Pastor wants to start back on this thing next week, so it's going to be the last part. Um, we talked about sickness and we talked about death. Last week we started talking about betrayal, and uh, we're going to pick back up right there. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to emphasize is kind of what I ended on last week. Don't seek revenge when people do you wrong. Don't seek revenge. I mean, this, this sounds like, yeah, I know that. But then every single time somebody does you wrong, and it's like, I really feel like getting them back or proving my point or, or showing to other people that I'm not, you know, I'm not what they said I, I am. You know, and so we go on this vendetta of trying to prove our innocence and, and in the process trying to prove their guilt. And uh, so we go through this long, you know, just destructive process. And uh, eventually we take up to Facebook and social media and we start posting stupid stuff and vindicating ourselves. And it's just, it's not a good idea. It's just not a good idea. It's just not. Um, another thing we do is we start gossiping about them because they started gossiping about us. See, it's easy when, you, when it's one and done. Somebody betrays you, you move on, right? Yes. But when somebody keeps on and keeps on and keeps on, it's like, ah, okay, I, I was good at first, now, now it's on. And uh, uh, that's very, actually very common. And the thing is, you have, to, you have to start well, but you also have to finish well. Yes. It's easy to, well, not easy. Doing the right thing is a victory. When you know we, we, we're treated wrong and we do the right thing, it's like, aha, I did. So then don't lose ground in that victory by, okay, well, this, I thought it was, this battle was going to end, but it just keeps going on. So now I'm going to start gossiping about them. Well, don't start a race well and then throw it away in the last lap. I mean, <coughs> that's hard. But this is something you just got to do. Another thing is bad prayers. Sometimes we cloak our prayers to make it sound better. And maybe even it comes from a, from a genuine heart. I'll give you an example. The Bible says to pray for my enemies. Okay. God, I know that if you would punish them, they would just turn. They would, they would hear and they would, they would turn. God, if you'd strike their children with sickness, they would, they would know in their hearts, hey, I'm messing up. And then they would turn, and it sounds good in our head. That sounds good. It's like, yes, smite them so they will obey you. Good idea. And it sounds good. And we convince ourselves we are so spiritual that we're praying for the destruction <coughs> for their betterment. <coughs> See, and we start twisting things up because we're hurt, and I don't know, we think that we're real smart and we're prideful and arrogant. And so we think, surely, you know, God can use a bad thing to make a good thing. So, okay, because they've done this bad thing, and they aren't changing. God needs to stop blessing them. So I need to pray for God to stop blessing them so that they'll know, hey, the blessing of God has been removed. So I need to repent. Ah, and then they'll, okay, and then everything will be better. See what I mean? We start justifying stupid prayers. And that's what I mean by bad prayers. When the Bible says to bless those who curse you, it literally means that. Bless them. Lord, I pray that you give them peace. I pray that you, you, you continue talking to them, continue working in them. Uh, I pray that you... You know, maybe, then maybe this, Lord, help them to see their error. Okay, that's okay. That's okay. That's more of God communing with their heart. Okay, all right. But when you start saying, they're so prideful that they will never see the truth, so you have to strike them with the curse so that they will see the truth. That takes us out of what Jesus told us to do. See, and it's a very gray, like gray area. You think, okay, we're, we're on this side. We're the good guys. And then somewhere you get muddied, and you're like, oh, man. By the time you realize that you have become the bad guy, <laughs> you're like, oh no, I couldn't possibly be because they were wrong. They wronged me. Um, so, okay, Matthew 26, 53. And we're just going to look at a few scriptures tonight, and then I'm just going to have a few things that we tie in from, from what we've looked at over the past two weeks. Matthew 26, starting in verse 53, says this. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? How then will the scriptures be fulfilled which say that it must happen this way? 
At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Then all the disciples left him and fled. So do you see how, how many times he said scriptures there? He's getting ready to be arrested, and look what he says. Pay attention this, this, this time for, for that. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? Okay, that was written in scripture, so this is a reference to scripture. And he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels. How then will the scriptures, now he clearly says scriptures, be fulfilled? So now we have two references to God's promises. At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching you did not seize me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets again. He says that three times in just a few verses, the, the idea here is very simple. Even when you're betrayed, hold on to God's promises. Hold on to God's promises. Jesus knew that he could get out of the pickle. But the problem is... If you got out of the pickle, then we wouldn't have a savior. You see, because that's the whole reason why he came. So, uh, what we do when we go into troubles is we just kind of start to forget that God has a plan. And we kind of start to forget to listen to God. Because, well, it hurts. I mean, that, yeah. Well, once again, disappointments are something that we face all the time. And as we pointed out last week, these Three specific areas that we're talking about, sickness, uh, death, and, and betrayal, the lessons that we're looking at apply to other areas of life of disappointment. Because everybody's going to face disappointment. disappointment. It's going gonna, it's gonna to blindside you, and it's going to be something that you personally struggle with. It's just going to happen. Luke 23, 34 says, But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. <coughs> and they cast out God. Maybe they don't know that what they're doing is wrong. If you would just show them by giving them terrors in the night and panic attacks and that you would, that you would bring sickness on them so they would know that what they're doing is wrong. That's not what he said, is it? Okay, let's read again what he said because when we are in pain, we forget what Jesus actually said for the sake of our pain. But Jesus was saying, continually, saying, not said, saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. So here it comes to a very interesting point. Move on. When somebody betrays you, when you've been hurt, just move on. Just move on. Now, what I, I don't mean this. Well, they done me wrong, so now I'm going to just go and have a nasty little attitude and just forget you. I didn't say forget you. I said move on. Jesus still had something to do, didn't he? He wasn't done yet. Right. Move on to what else God has you to do. I'm not saying forget them. I'm saying move on. Um, Matthew 10, 34 through 37. <coughs> do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Again, we have here, Jesus told us we would be betrayed. He told us we would be betrayed, even by our family. Still blind, it still catches us by surprise. Like, but they were closer to me than anybody. Jesus told us it was going to happen. I mean, this can't, this can't surprise you that that bad. I mean, it does, but at the same time, it should. Um, okay, uh, Matthew five ten through twelve. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now notice though, and I know pastors mentioned this, but it's worth mentioning again, because of me. Not because you did stupid stuff and it's catching up to you. Okay? He's not saying that. He's saying when you are treated unjustly. Okay? You did the right thing, they did the wrong thing. Okay, so just so we're all clear. 
Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Which brings us to a very difficult part of betrayal. Now, remember last week we were talking about the five stages of grief. And the last of the five stages was acceptance. And that kind of applies to a lot of situations. You'll find that you go through the five stages of grief in minor parts, not just in big parts as well. Like, for instance... You go to watch your favorite show on Netflix. It's not there. Denial. It has to be here. Then anger. They took it off! <laughs> what? And then finally, you know, you work through the five stages and you get to the last, okay, the Netflix doesn't have my show on anymore. Okay, let's find something else to watch. So, I mean, it happens all throughout life in, in other areas, not just in, in life or death situations, but in, in everything. So with that being said, when somebody betrays you, there's a certain part of you that will try and just hold on to it, like, this can't actually be happening. And to really be able to work through the situation and forgive them <coughs> and move on, you have to accept it. It happened. It, it, it happened. It did. Um, we, we really do like to deny the reality of the situation in front of us. Like, maybe I misunderstood. Or, you know, we wake up and we're like, that was just a bad a bad week. I'm sure that maybe things aren't as bad as I thought they were. It's like, oh no, they're worse than I thought they were. Uh, but okay. And in Matthew 6, 12. <coughs> and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. No wounds can heal if you keep picking at it. Okay? So this the first thing. A wound is kind of like a blister, okay? That's a great image. As long as you leave it alone, it'll heal. But the problem is it starts healing, and then something reminds us of it, and so we start peeking at it again. And then we say, we, try, we fool ourselves too, because we say, no, I'm okay with it now, so now I can talk about it. And so we start peeking at it again, and it starts bleeding again. You kind of get what I'm saying? I think God has these little hidden, hidden messages for us all throughout his creation. And I think that scabs are one of those ways that he gives us these little hidden messages. Like, for instance, scars. You know, a scar is a proof that healing is happening. Now, we might look at our scars and say, that looks ugly and hideous. It's a part of who we are, though. It shows that we have healed. It shows that we have lived. And it shows that we didn't die. But when we see scars on our person, we think, this is the worst thing in the world if it hadn't have happened in the first place. You know, and it's, well, it did happen, though. Okay. So there's just a few things we're going to work through. Uh, we're not really going to look at any more scripture because I'm just kind of drawing more principles from the stuff that we've already looked at over the past few weeks. So if we keep going back and forth, we're just going to kind of spend a lot of time rereading the things that we've already read. The first thing... Pray for them and bless them. I can't say this enough. When people do you wrong, pray for them. When somebody's in pain, pray for them. When somebody's sick, pray for them. There's this idea, pray for them. And we've lost a lot of that in today's, uh, today's world, especially, <coughs> think about politics, for instance. You have all these Christians who, who don't like President Trump, so they think that that frees them from the obligation of praying for him. Well, no. No, it doesn't. Hmm. You, you see, we have to pray for our leaders. That was actually a specific thing that Paul said. It doesn't matter if you like them or not. You see what I mean? We give ourselves little excuses for not, for not listening to what God said. It's like, well, it's different because I don't like this president. Well, you don't have to like them. You have to pray for them. There's a big difference there. Um, okay. Um, don't spiritualize disobedience. So it's okay for me because I'm more spiritual. Other people need to pray for the president or whatever. But me, I'm, I'm more spiritual. I've come to a, a higher sense of reality with God. And he understands you know, what, I, what my beef is with him and, and how un, un, unbiblical this man is. And so it's okay for me to not do what God said because I'm above the rules. I'm more mature than other people. <coughs> you, you see how we start kind of – and we start <coughs> to believe the things that we're telling ourselves. Now, don't tell your spouse this because they're going to look at you like this and they're going to say, you need to change your attitude on me. But we don't tell other people this. We just kind of keep it in our hearts. You know, 
People don't need to know how great I am. As long as I know how great I am, we'll, we're all good. Um, sometimes you come to, the, come to the place of even saying something along the similar. God gave that command for the stupid people who couldn't figure it out. Not like me. So that's for the general people. Then there's me. I'm God's gift. And we don't say it like that. We say it like this. You know, I, that's more of an introductory idea, gen, a general principle. But then, you know, once you, once you know God like I do, see what I mean? We, we cloak it. We don't call it pride. We, we, we call it something else. <laughs> um, don't repeat the error. Let them go. Sometimes, and I'm talking a large part about repeating the error in your mind and in your memory. Just keep going over and over it. Don't, don't repeat it in your mind. You have to just kind of clear it from your head. It's kind of like this. You know what you do on a computer when you're going to reuse a program? And so you don't want to go through the, the bother of having to restart it again and all that. You leave the program running in the background. Like, for instance, let's say you're on the, inter the internet, okay, and you have multiple tabs open. Well, I'm going to go back to this tab, so I'll leave it open. I'll open a new, new tab, and then I'll come back to it. Kind of like that. That's kind of like what we do with betrayal sometimes. Well, I'm not on that tab right now, but you still have it running in the background. You know what I mean? You still have it running in the background. Close the tab. Close it. Just close it off. Uh, no! <laughs> uh, do you know what happens when you have too many tabs open on your computer? It starts doing this. Moving real slow and the mouse starts going real... Uh -huh. Same thing happens to you spiritually too. You can't keep it running in the background and expect it not to mess with your operation. Okay, um, and then another thing is don't repeat the error. What I mean by that in another way is don't allow the same thing to happen over and over again. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm sure you do understand what I mean, so I'm just going to skip past the next thing. One of the very most difficult things you will ever learn to do, forgive and forget. Because when somebody betrays you, you're going to see betrayal in everyone. Especially if the person who betrays you was someone who was really close to you. You see betrayal in everyone. It's behind every tree. You know, all of a sudden, if you have the smallest disagreement with someone, it's because they're plotting on you too. You know what I mean? And, and we just get ourselves in a state of constant paranoia. Where it's like, well, who's going to lead me next? Who's next on the list? You know, and, and it's, not, it's not a healthy way to live. It, in fact, I would say going further, it, it's impossible to live there. It's, what I mean by forget, it's not that, it's not that you forget, the, forget what happened in the past. And it's not that you don't leave room to repeat the error. It's that you embrace it as something that happened. This happened. And you move on. <coughs> yeah. It's no longer in, in your operation. You close down that one. Does that make sense? Okay. So, uh, another thing is gossiping and complaining. I've been so unfairly treated. Maybe you were, but you're, you're not going to get anywhere by complaining about it. Everybody's looking down like you guys all know what I'm talking about. It's been a rough, <laughs> rough week, huh? <laughs> I, I get it, guys. I really do. Uh, but when you complain about stuff, it, it really is counterproductive. Because you're using up your energy, and what it does, you know, they've done a lot of amazing studies on this stuff. When you, when you complain, it actually tells your brain to stop looking for a solution to a problem. And so you start being less productive in other areas, too. Let me give you, let me give you a hypothetical situation, which isn't so hypothetical. You and your wife get in a fight. You leave the house mad. You get to work. You can't think a solution at the problem at work. Why? Because you're still upset. Mad at the problem at home. You're still mad at the problem at home. Right. <laughs> it, it literally takes away <laughs> your brain's efficiency. Mm -hmm. So now men, men hate to be inefficient. I mean, they, they wish everything could just be worked out into little boxes. When I come home, I want this done and this done and this done. The kids, you have to be perfect on this and this and this. 
and wife, you have to have this done and this and this. You know, we're, we're very task oriented. We want to work everything into this perfect little, you know, uh, set of, of boxes. And, and oh man, that would look great. If you could have, Gracie, when I get home, if you could have a pie chart of how the day was worked with the kids, that would be great. That's how men think. See what I mean? There's a lot of life that happens off of that pie chart. Um, stop talking about them, good or bad. What I found, for me, I don't know if this applies to you guys, but it does to me, even if you're not talking bad about them, just talking about them, even in, in, in like, let's say, for instance, um, John and I don't have relations anymore. We're, we're completely broken off. <clears throat> we don't keep up with each other. That's the end of that. Okay, so this, let, let's say that's the setting, okay? Now, if I say, let's say I'm talking to someone else, like, hey, Nicole, um, you know, John used to work over at this place where he was able to get uh, good deals for on whatever it is that you're buying, you know, on, on a new, new vacuum. See what I mean? Just talking in an innocent way like that, it opens a door. It opens a door. And here's the thing about your heart. It's very deceitful. Your heart will tell you that you're fine when it's not. And it's better to just close the door and keep it closed. Does that make sense? Don't let your heart fool you into thinking, hey, I can handle this. I'm strong enough. No, you aren't. Don't be stupid. You're not strong enough. If you open that door again, you, how many times does Jesus talk about Judas after the night that Judas betrayed him and left? Not one single time. Not one single time. He doesn't talk about him after the resurrection. He doesn't talk about it in the book of Revelation, which was a whole vision and dream that, that God gave to John. That Judas is never mentioned. Why? Because it wasn't productive. It was off topic. In fact, the, the New Testament writers only mention him to, to, for a very simple point, and then they move on. But Jesus himself, the one who gave the mission, didn't say, hey, uh, you know, here's the Great Commission. Go into all the world, but, and don't be like Judas. He didn't say that. He kept them moving forward. See what I mean? <coughs> so once again, stop talking about them. Just even in passing, just just let it go. And another thing is heal. For for whatever reason, we we try and get a mortal wound and play it off like it's not a mortal wound. Imagine let's let's imagine a a, a war <coughs> scenario. Okay, you're in the trenches. Bombs are falling. Guns are firing, and you get shot. In the arm, and your artery starts going off, and you're like, it's fine. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. So then the artillery starts bombing you, and the arm gets blown off completely. I'm fine. I'll bounce back. Really, it's going to be okay. And uh, blood is just going everywhere, and you're losing strength, but hey, I'm fine. I'm fine. And yet we do the exact same thing in our spirits. We do the exact same thing with our mental health. You know, we start having, having serious problems. We're up all night worrying about stuff. We can't see straight. We can't solve problems anymore. We're not parenting right. We're not being a good spouse. We have problem after problem, and yet we still deny that there's a problem. You know, most times that women go to divorce their husbands, most of the time the husband answers with this, what? Why? They're oblivious to the problem. Like, what? The majority of the time that happens. Do you ever wonder why? <laughs> so anyways, okay, so some ways that you can heal. Read books. This will definitely open your eyes to problems, solutions, that kind of stuff. It's just a good idea. There's lots of good books out there. There's a lot of bad books too, but you know, have some discretion. I read a lot of books. This year so far, I've read over 100 books. What I do is I give it about 100 pages to impress me. Give me your best book. And if I get some bad feelings within the first like 10 pages, I'm like, ah, I'll give you a good example. Uh, Game of Thrones, the first book, I forget what it's called. I think it's actually called The Game of Thrones. Uh, yeah. I started reading it, I was like, that was a really good story. And then there was a lot of stuff. And so I was like, okay, well, we'll just try and skip past those parts. But it was like everywhere. You can't skip past it when it's the entire book. So I got to page like 115 or 200 and something like that. And this book has 700 and something pages. So at that point, I did an evaluation. Cost benefit? Nope. Another book. It's on leadership. I start reading. Hey, this has some great stuff to do. To do. Then I hit a part that's just wow, that's totally off. So I kept going because I had a good feeling about this book, and I was right. It was. It had some bad stuff in there, but it also had some good stuff. See what I mean? Do 
you, you don't don't just read things. I mean, you have limited time, but do 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 read things. Um, counseling. For some reason, people are scared of this word. Mm -hmm. and maybe it's because there's so many bad counselors out there. Find a good counselor and then go to them. <laughs> it's okay to talk out your problems. You know. I mean, think of it like this. Your spouse is kind of like a counselor. You talk out your, or at least you should talk out your problems with your spouse. Uh, and you know, you work towards a solution together. That's a, a smaller form of counseling. A pastor is a counselor in a way. Maybe not in the same way as, a, as you know, a, someone with a, a license. But I mean, in a way, we are, we are still counselors. So it's not, it shouldn't really blow us that much out of proportion to seek a professional counselor. Uh, read the Bible. For some reason, when we go through hard times, we kind of just stop reading the Bible. Maybe we feel like God won't hear us. Maybe we just feel ashamed of the situation. Maybe we just feel too hurt. Maybe we just are kind of holding back from God because we're like, I know what he's going to say, and I don't want him to say it. I know I've done that. When you go through a, a time of just deep, deep hurt, and you're like, God, I know what you're, I know what you're going to say. I know what you're going to say. I just don't want to hear it. You're going to tell me that I'll get through this, and I don't think I will. And so you sit there and you think, it's okay, I'll just, I'll just ignore it, and I'll pick up where I left off. And you sit there and you hurt, when all the while, God's just sitting there waiting. See what I mean? Okay, uh, prayer. For some reason, Christians drastically um, will just miss the opportunity that is prayer. And we don't know how powerful prayer is because we don't pray. You know, I was reading something the other day. Half, half of America has never read the Bible all the way through. But a large majority, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. 11% of America has read the Bible all the way through. I said that wrong. Yet over, almost half of America believes that the Bible is not, um, uh, have any worth. It, it, it doesn't apply to your life. Um, it's not really beneficial. But yet, oh, oh, only 11% has read it. Right. Do you see the problem here? <laughs> we like to say, oh, there's power in the Word, but then we don't like to read the Word. We like to say, hey, prayer is a good idea, but then we don't actually like to pray. Well, I don't have time to do that. I get that life is busy. But I get that Jesus was pretty busy, too, and it said that he got the one and prayed. That tells me that if Jesus, you know, God, was praying, hey, maybe I should do. So... Uh, and then support groups, you know, when I talk about some support groups, I'm not talking about a bunch of people who have a bad, nasty attitude to the person who you have a bad, nasty attitude with, and you all get together in the same house and start talking about how terrible they are. That's not a support group. I mean, like, for instance, a group where you actually get help. Counselors do this um, oftentimes. Um, one example would be maybe like an AA group. I think that's con technically considered a support group. Something like that. There are such things as, as grieving support groups, and, you know, they're... They are out there. So anyways. Um, now here's just a real quick thing. You might look at the things that I said about forgiving and whatnot and say, well, so that means if they come on, if they mosey on by, I just need to open them, open them and accept them with, with open arms. And, no. Trust is earned. Trust is earned. Never forget that. Trust is earned. Before God gives us something big, he tests us, doesn't he? He tests us. And then, according to our test, he gives us something else. And then he tests us. If God himself, who already knows how we're going to act, tests us, don't you think that maybe you would be wise not to just blindly believe someone? Especially if someone has a history of betrayal, you just, I'm not saying, you know, they can never, you know, move on and, and healing can never come, but just don't be stupid about it, you know. Um, if they apologize, give it time and watch, observe, just kind of see if they live what they're saying that they live. Um, now, I'm not saying wait for them to stumble and then second that they have the slightest, you know, misstep. Don't don't believe. Like for instance, did you guys know that Kanye West released a Christian um, album? Did you guys know that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Kind of well, like no. <laughs> well, I, I went and listened to it, and, and uh, it's not my style of music. It, his style really has never been my style of music. But I will say this: it's it's there's a lot of preaching in there. I mean, he's just 
I mean, I listened to Christian music and I was thinking, wow, this is preach heavy, you know. Uh, and in fact, the last song in it is just called Jesus is Lord. And it has like four lines in it, or two lines in it. Um, you, you would think that I'd be able to remember it. I just listened to it this afternoon. Uh, he basically says, every knee will bow, Jesus is Lord. It's the whole song. The whole thing. And this is Kanye West saying this. The same guy who said, hey, I'm God, is, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how to feel about it, but I know that this, I know, I know that that album was his attempt to glorify God. And you could tell from the lyrics that they were heartfelt, regardless of whether he sticks with it or not. And, uh, well, I guess that's all I have to say about that. Um, so anyways, if they caused a church conflict, just stay out of it. Just stay out of it. Stay out of it. You know how many people I've seen think, that's between you and them? I'm still good with them. And so they still get with them, and then the attitude spreads. It's like, it's like cancer or gangrene or something else that spreads rapidly. It's just not, it's not good. It never ends well. And we always tell ourselves, it won't happen to me because that wasn't part of the problem. And I'm smart enough. I'm mature enough. You know, it's like, okay, well, after you're done smelling your farts, you might want to go ahead and, and, and let some distance develop there. Don't hang around with people who cause problems in church. Yeah. Because here's the thing, it will spread. Guys, it, it does. It really, really does. And that's, that is biblical, so just, you know, remember that. Um, and keep your distance from them. Here's the thing. Everybody has good stories. Everybody has good stories. You know, they can, they can, they can tell you quite the, you know, spin quite the yarn about how they were the victim. and People mistreated you. You should, you should hear, hear some of the things that I hear people come to us and say, did you really do that to them? And I'm like, what? What are we talking about? I'm like, I, What? The story gets so warped and stuff where they're the victim and they've been so wronged by everybody. It's like, that's not what happened at all. I mean, this is none of your business, so we're not talking about it, but what? <laughs> what? There, there has been some times when, when, when somebody say, well, they said that you did this, and I had to like sit and think about it because it was so far off from the truth. That it was, what? But anyways, you know, it makes a good story anyhow, and uh, I love fiction. Uh, I guess that they should have just written it in a book. That way I can enjoy it too. Uh, anyways, um, so remember that. Um, now Hebrews does tell us that, that when there's someone who abandons the faith, that there is nothing you can do to win them back. Remember that. When somebody turns away from the faith, you can't win them with an argument. Because what are you going to say? Jesus? They already know about Jesus. That's the Jesus that they rejected. Now I'm not saying God can't do something, but... You can't do anything. And remember, if the Holy Spirit hasn't gotten through to them yet, why do you think that you would be able to? It's just, it's some kind of pride to say that I'm more powerful than the Holy Spirit himself. I mean, just throwing that out there. Um, if you were wrong in a situation, even if you were only partially wrong, honestly, just apologize. Conduct yourself with integrity. Clear the air. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, integrity is a good thing. You know what I mean? Be a person of integrity. Where people know, hey, you're going to do the right thing because that's who you are. Even when people are, other people are doing the wrong thing, you're still going to do the right thing. And what we do like to do is we like to make ourselves the victim in everything so that everybody feels sorry for us. And we all do it. If you're thinking, no, I don't do that, yes, you should do that. We all, we all do it. Um, when somebody betrays you, it is their fault, not yours. For some reason, as Christians, we like to shift the blame because we're Christians. It has to be our fault all the time. If somebody betrays you, it was their fault. You see, a lot of Christians just have a hard time with this. If I would have done this, if I would have done this, if I... Right. It was their fault. They made the choice. Okay? They made the choice. It's like this. If a man cheats on the wife, is it the wife's fault because she didn't have sex with him? No. No. It's his fault. He took the oath to her. That's right. right? Before God. If he cheated, it's his fault. If you're in a loveless, sexless marriage, that doesn't give you the right to lie to God. I mean, goodness sakes, you took an oath as a man. Be a man and say, I will die. If I never have sex with you again, I will die. I will go to the grave being faithful because that is the man that I am because that's the man God called me to be. That is being a man. Being a man is not demanding sex. 
Being a man is not saying, hey, you have to surrender your body to me because I want sex. That's not being a man. Being a man is saying, even if my desires aren't fulfilled, I will still work for your desires. That is being a man. That is hard, but that is being a man. Anyways, uh, don't beat yourself up for loving and serving people. What we do sometimes is we do everything right and then something goes wrong and we say, I shouldn't have poured the time into them. Mm, no, hold on. Never, never, never beat yourself up for loving and serving people. You will love and serve some people who will spit in your face. Never, ever, ever regret it. And God has more people for you to spit in your face. God will bring by more people that will also spit in your face. But not everyone will. Remember that. Jesus, you really see him going to everyone. Not just the people who would accept him. And I remember one key part when everyone who was following him left. And he lost many of his disciples. And uh, I don't know who else was there, but it seems like only the 12 were there. Possibly a few others, but mostly just the 12. And it's like, well, going from hundreds to 12, hey, that's a real church boom right there. Uh, okay. Uh, keep loving and serving regardless of the situation. And that's just something you need to remember regardless. Don't get people on your side. This is what we do. And I mentioned this again. It's, I mentioned this before in the, uh, last week. It's worth mentioning again. I did what was right, and they keep doing what's wrong. So now I need to get people on my side so they see that I'm, I did what was right. That makes sense in, in your head somewhere. But once again, so you did what was right at first, and now you're doing what's wrong. See, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't fit. Just because you did what was right and it didn't pay off and they're still going at it and they're going on and on and on. And everybody you talk to has a new rumor for you about how terrible of a person you are when you didn't do any of those things. That, <laughs> that doesn't give you the right. And guys, I'm saying, I'm saying this from experience. It doesn't give you the right to start doing what's wrong because of their wrong. That's a hard lesson to learn. When, now... Imagine this. When somebody mistreats you, and then you pray and cry out to God, and he says, hey, I'm working in you. Working in me? I was the victim, God. Work in them. They're doing what's wrong, and they're still doing it. And God's meanwhile saying, mm, I'm working in you. I'm working patience in you, for instance. <laughs> the, the audacity of you, God. I cannot believe this. I need patience when they're the ones who's been evil? Mm. See how God works? He does things where even if we think that they need it more than we need it, God still works in us. And you know what I found? It's not necessarily that God isn't working in them. It's that my drone business. Mm -hmm. See, we like to put ourselves in the place of God. God, let me tell you how to do your job right because you're not doing it right currently. Meanwhile, God is saying, okay, let me tell you I'm the master of all this. Just because you don't understand what I'm doing doesn't mean I have to sit there and explain it to you. Imagine this. You have a three-year-old who follows you around all day telling you how everything that you're doing is wrong. Daddy, I saw you go to work and you did this. That was wrong. Okay, you don't understand the intricacies of work, little man. I'm, I mean, i got a lot of stuff going on here. I have to do this like this. And he's trying to explain it to them. And, well, okay. Daddy, you shouldn't have done this. It's like, you're three years old. What do you know about the world? I changed your diaper six months ago. You, you, you see what I'm saying? That's what we do with God. God, I'm holding you accountable because I'm God in this situation. It's like, uh, no. No, God's still God even if he's doing something you don't like. God is still God even if he's doing something you don't like. Okay. If they continue to talk bad about you, okay, they, 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 it was just a one-time betrayal, but then they, keep, they just keep spreading stuff. They just let it go. Let it go. Even if they're still going, if they're still talking bad about you, let it go. People will eventually see your actions. Or they'll hear about your actions and it'll cause them to think twice. Either way, the person who's mean and hateful, that kind of attitude is pretty obvious. Eventually, people will catch on. And they'll have less and less people that, that are close to them. And that's, that's really is a tragedy because you'll find that a lot of the times when you intend evil for someone else, God just has a way of bringing it back on you. A lot of 
five times that you you intend evil for someone. So really, don't 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 rejoice when somebody else gets their comeuppance. It don't. That's the stupidest thing you could do. Because you should desire mercy for them. Think about the people who wronged you. Do you really want them to go to hell and burn for eternity? That's a terrible thing to want on somebody. Just because they did you wrong? Jeez, grow up and get over it. I mean, there's more to life than one person who wronged you. There's billions of people on the planet, guys. Billions. Goodness sakes, if you find one who betrays you and doesn't like you, go find another eight billion out there. Goodness sakes. Anyways, never defend yourself on social media. I know I already said that. So why did I say it again? Because we always do. If you're mad, stay off of social media. Stop texting people. It's okay to be quiet. It's all right. You know, when the Bible talks about, um, you know, being quiet and have, how, how dignified that is before God, that's good advice. That's real good advice. How dignified it is to keep your mouth shut. Don't be defensive or argumentative. You don't have to prove you were right. And when you get in that attitude, it starts seeping into your other relationships. You start getting defensive about everything. You know, and then you're on edge and your wife says, hey, uh, can you take the trash out? I'll do it when I feel like it. <laughs> Why? Because we're already on edge because we're on the, we're still in fight mode. Uh -huh. It's like, have you ever seen somebody who goes and gets in a serious fight on Facebook or YouTube and then they get off their computer and they're, they're huffing and puffing and they're walking back and forth. And, and it's like, geez, don't talk to them. They're on fire. You might catch on fire yourself. Don't be defensive or argumentative. Just... Just let it go. And this is where some serious soul searching comes in. You really have to ask yourself, where am I at? And then you have to go to people who tell you the truth and say, look guys, where am I at? Where am I at? Get real people in your corner. You don't need people who just validate you for you. That's just terrible. Um, if the problem doesn't die down, address it only if you must and only to who you must. Only if you must and only to who you must. Let's say, for instance, the entire community thinks that I, um, I hit Nicole. There's a good example. Now, obviously, that's not true. And Nicole can just say, hey, no, he didn't hit me. But some people, when they make up their mind, they just run with it. I mean, it, it, don't, don't tell me about the facts, man. This is, this is clearly my decision of reality, and it's the one I'm going to stick with. Okay? So then, eventually, it's going to probably start to die down. Um, but this is an example of when it might, might start to be uh, beneficial to address it. Ricky comes to me and he starts giving me a speech about how I need to stop hitting the, hitting the call and how unbiblical it is and how he's going to call the cops the next time it happens. Might be a good idea to address that. Okay, hold on. I love your heart. I'm glad you're willing to defend people. Ask Nicole yourself. I didn't do that. See what I mean? Only to who you must. Okay? And only, uh, and only if you must. Don't get distracted from your mission. So what we do is because, because something happened, we get distracted and we, okay, so my mission is no longer to do this for God. Now it's, okay, I'm putting out little fires. Well, before you know it, all your attention is putting out, out on all these little fires and you forgot what your mission in life was. Why am I even here anymore? Surely I wasn't created to put out fires all day. No, you weren't. Uh, being Christian doesn't mean you have to put yourself in bad situations. I'm obviously talking about abuse here. If uh, you or someone you, you know is in physical danger, please do get help. I know that yeah, I really have time to talk about this in great detail, but there are confidential ways um, to get help, um, especially for children. Don't, don't continually subject your children to an abusive situation. Um, I see a lot of times, very unfortunately, people who are on drugs uh, date people who are just not good for their kids. Uh, to the point of molestation or abuse. And because they're so hungry for love, they're willing to continue to subject their child to this terrible. Get help. Get help. Do it for you and do it for the kids. Seriously. It, that's, you can get help from a pastor very confidentially. You can even say you're going in for something else and then just tell the pastor that you lied about that. And he will do what it was necessary to get you safe. You, there's ways of getting cops involved without the person knowing. There's ways of, of, of getting, there, there, there's ways of doing it. Just don't give up. And if he says he's sorry for the 500th time, he's lying.
Okay, so we're just gonna move on from there, but really get don't don't just live with that. If you're ever betrayed, you will go right back to uh, to it in someone else if you don't heal. I cannot tell you how many surprisingly surprisingly how many times this happens. A woman goes from an abusive situation to another abusive situation. It's like, but you just got out that one. Yeah. It's really, really, really essential that you heal. Because if you don't, and you are betrayed, you will literally go right back to it. And I'm not just talking about women here, too. We, we all do the same things, um, and not just abusive relationships. Um, you know, somebody betrays us, and, and, and we're so hurt that we immediately go to another. Let me get, try and give you a hypothetical situation. Um, let's say I, I'm, I'm the pastor, the senior pastor. I'm an A pastor, not the pastor. Let's say I'm the pastor. And uh, Ricky uh, uh, does something. He betrays me in some way, and it just really causes a big stink in the church. So let's say Tim was his right-hand man in it, and I say, oh, man, well, Tim's still here. I'm going to appoint him as my right-hand man. See, out, out of just exasperation, out of hurt, appointing someone who's the same problem. See what I mean? And we do this in lots of different ways in life, and I hope that you can see how it applies because I really don't have time to elaborate too much more on that. Uh, and I will say this. Divorce doesn't bring healing. It stops the damage from getting worse and healing from coming while causing more damage. That's a lot. So let me kind of break it down. First off, there's this idea about divorce in pop culture that it fixes all the problems. It doesn't. It, it doesn't. Out of 100% out of, of all the divorces that I've ever seen, it never ends well. It never ends well. I have never once seen a divorce go well. I've never once seen a divorce where the people don't get changed from it. Now, after saying that, it doesn't, it, it stops that damage from getting worse, but it also stops healing from, in the situation from happening. And it brings new harm that you didn't know existed while you were married. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's say, Let's say you're in a situation where the husband is just very um, mean. He talks down to you. And so rather than going through help or anything like that, you just divorce him. And now, although that problem hasn't gotten any worse or better, um, now you find yourself dealing with an, an attitude problem of hardness of heart. So you've brought another problem. You see how that works? It, it's something where it, it, divorce always gives another problem. Divorce always gives another problem. Now, I'm not saying that, I'm not commenting on whether or not anyone has ever validated in getting, I don't, I don't care. I'm, I, that's not my point at all, I don't care. What I'm talking about is don't think that divorce is this cure-all just because the pop culture tells you that. You will have more problems, and that's just how that's going to go. Be ready for that. Ideally, every, every uh, married person will get help, but we as men really don't. Don't tell me what to do. I know what I'm doing. Um, here, but here's another thing. I will say this. Your spouse will betray you. And what I mean by that is they will, they will let you down. They will offend you because that's – people will let you down. A strong marriage is dependent on forgiving and rebuilding. I know I talked about abuse. No, we're not talking about abuse. We're talking about a regular marriage situation. A strong marriage is dependent on forgiving and rebuilding. It's dependent on it because your spouse will do something that offends you. You have to rebuild you will get mad at your spouse, you have to rebuild. That's what marriage is. Now, it, I will say this. I know that some people think it's, it's two people giving 50-50. I know some people say, no, it's two people giving 100%. The answer is neither of those things. Real marriage is usually varies between you giving absolutely nothing to you giving 100%. That's how real marriage works. The husband is going to have his act together one day, then not the next day. The wife is going to be crazy one day and then completely loving the next. That's how people are. Do you ever have an off day? So, just a few things. When you are betrayed, now catch on to this because this is the very last thing we're going to say. Then we're closing with this. When you have been betrayed, people become plus and minus signs. How can they benefit me and how can they take away from me? Do I have the energy for this person? Because I've been hurt with this person, now other people become plus and minus signs. Let me give you an example. Kirk and Renee are not here. They are in California. Now, they do a lot of the cleaning of the church. So, if I've been betrayed, my probable reaction is going to be something like this. I really wish they were here to clean, because now I had to do it. See, they become nothing more to me than a plus and minus sign. 
I'm not interested about them as people. I'm interested in them so much as they can benefit me. Now, why do we do that when we're hurt? Because we've been hurt. <laughs> I'm telling you this so you can know. So you can know. For Jesus, people were people. And for us, they should be people too. Um, so just three, three last things here about betrayal and, uh, and disappointments. This actually is for all, dis all disappointments. Anytime you, you, you've been done with disappointments, remember this. You need the three sacred things. First off is sacred places. This is something where you, this is a place where you get alone to be with God. It has no technology in it. It has no distractions. There's no TV. There's no anything. It's just a place for you and God. I know some people who literally made a closet in their house. And they go in there and shut the door. Okay, that's fine. Just as long as you can get there. Excuse me, and you can get there on a daily basis. I wouldn't pick somewhere like Canada. <laughs> because you can't go there every day. I mean, unless you live there, in which case, I'm sorry. Uh, but, you know, uh, the second sacred, sacred times. This time of each day is for God. There's something that happens, guys, it's so special. There's something that happens when you have sacred places and sacred times. You feel it in your spirit. And you know I'm going to meet with God right now. Yep. I know God's with us all the time, I know that. But there's just something special about that secret a secret place. This is my this is my place. This is my place. This is my time. I'm going to be with God. Now, for most of you who have kids, if you're going to do it in the morning, you have to be real early because kids wake up at butt crack of dawn. For no apparent reason. For no apparent reason. <laughs> it's like okay, you guys went to bed last night at eleven. <laughs> you should be in bed till night. Two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Why are you awake right now? Yes. I speak from that we senior have, We had that this morning. I looked at my daughter and I was like... Why? The guy hasn't even poured my first Did you know that I had it kid? this morning too? <laughs> okay, okay, last night, Teresa goes to sleep at 11 o'clock, guys. I couldn't get her to sleep. She just couldn't go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> so then she gets up. I kid you not, I can't make this stuff up. She gets up at 6 o'clock. I was like, do you never sleep? <laughs> Do you never sleep? When the school day starts. Oh my goodness. And they want to sleep and they won't wake up. So, okay, if you're I don't have a problem with the not waking up. It's the going to bed. And then they're up before I am. I'm like, my alarm clock hasn't even went off yet. Why are you awake? Gracie literally said this. She said, you need to go back to bed. <laughs> go. Back to bed. Go. Uh, anyways, uh, um, so if you're gonna, if you have kids in the house, you need to think this one through. You really do. It has to be at a time when you know the kids aren't gonna be up. Because here's the thing, guys. It's good to play with your kids. I'm not saying that. Make time for your kids. That is job number one as a father. Your your wife and your kids. That's job number one. However, however, you need to make time for God. In there, okay. God's like God's not on the list. God is above the list. Your whole life revolves around God. On the list, wife and kids. Wife takes primary over kids, but, okay, so, uh, okay, does that kind of make sense? Okay, so with that being said, you have to get alone <laughs> with God. I mean, you need that. Now, you can do late at night after everyone's gone to sleep. You can do that, but here's the problem. It sometimes gets a little bit hard to think when you've been working all day and your brain is fried. I mean, fried. If you have some of those mentally challenging jobs, if you have one that's physically challenging, that's hard too. That's hard too because like you sit down and your body's just like, okay, bedtime. But if you have a mentally challenging job like teaching or writing or you know that kind of stuff, it, your brain is just not there. You talk to your wife about the same thing 15 times. Anyways, um, so sacred places and sacred, sacred times. And the third sacred thing, sacred people. Now, there are different kinds of people that fit, that fit into this life. Some people, they will love your passion. They're behind you all the way to soak it up. Not to contribute to you as a person. These are the milk suckers. They're, they're the pieces of the cereal that are left in the milk. They just absorb the milk and they just get, they don't have any flavor to them. You're just like, ew. You know, when you get to the end of your bowl and you're just like, it's like eating snot. Okay? It's, now, let me put it like this. It's not that they're against you. They're just not with you. Uh, Chris Songson puts it like this, the difference between agreement and alignment. Okay? They, they, yeah, yeah, you're doing great things, 
I'm not going to help you with those great things, but you're doing great things. <laughs> like adoption. You see people do this a lot. Yeah, you should adopt. So then we adopt. Hey, can we have any help? No. no. <laughs> See so, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not that they're against you. They think what you're doing is great. They're just not going to help you in that direction. Then there's some people who are negatives. All they do is drain energy. They've always got problems every day. Now, obviously, friends help each other. I'm not saying that, but there are some people who are just draining people. And then no matter how much you help them, you're still the bad guy, and they go and talk bad about you. And then they need you the next day. It's like, we just did this, guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? The people who just drain you. And you know those kinds of people. You, you know. Now, here's the thing. Those kinds of people will always get guilt trip you. They'll say, you need to be here for me 24-7, and if you aren't, you're not being like Christ. I'm sorry, but that's a little, little hogwash. That's just a little hogwash. You're going to have to find your peace with that and move on. However you find your peace with that is probably going to be thrown in prayer. But you can't give your constant attention to people who are just draining you all the time. So that takes us to sacred people. These are people who will actually pour into you. The first one is a mentor. Everyone needs people in their life who pour into them. You are not an island, and you do not have it all figured out. You need help. You need mentors with your job. You need mentors with your ministry. You need mentors with your spiritual life and development. You need mentors. You need mentors. Okay? Uh, another, another group is an encourager. These are people who are useful but not overly. This is why. They encourage you to keep going. They remind you, they remind you hey, why you're doing all this stuff. But at the end of the day, if you don't get your crap together, you're going to just need them to repeat the same thing they <coughs> said to you yesterday again tomorrow. It's just going to be a thing of they always had to pour into you and then you become the negative person. Encouragers are good for getting you when you're off your, when you're off your feet. Don't stay off your feet, though. See, how encouragers have a very limited, limited um, benefit to your future. Okay? Um, I'm not, once again, I'm not trying to reduce people, but the, I'm just kind of simplifying this. Then the next thing you need is correctors. These are people who say, your attitude stinks. However they say it to you, whatever, I don't care. You need to change. Okay? But you don't understand the situation. I don't understand the situation. You are right, but I do understand your attitude. The next, the prayers. Whoever they are, you know that they're going to pray about it. You know. You need these people in your life. You don't need people who will get your prayer request and then talk about it, or talk to you about your prayer request, or talk about other, talk to other people about it. You don't need them. You need somebody who actually prays about it. Okay? Um, the next one is a partner, somebody who will come, so come alongside with you and do the thing with you. Hopefully this is your spouse, but obviously you need other people besides your spouse. You can't expect your, your spouse to clean up your mess all day long. It's just too much weight, honestly. <laughs> um, and then the last group is pastors. These aren't necessarily official pastors. A good, a, official pastor is a good idea, but when I say, use the term pastor, I mean somebody who's willing to disciple you and work with you in a more intimate setting. That make sense? Yeah. Okay, so remember those three sacred things. Whenever you're done with disappointments, Remember those three sacred things. They will get you through any disappointment in life. Sacred places, sacred times, sacred people. Never forget that. And so that's the conclusion to all this done with disappointment. Remember those three sacreds. Because you will face disappointment in your life. And it will happen. These three sacred things will get you through it. Remember them. Guard them. Invest in them. You might say, I don't have those people in my life. Find them. Find them in your life. You need them in your life. You might say, I don't have a place. Make a place. You need these three sacred things in your life. And we'll stop there. You can go ahead and stop it.